can QE rescue the Eurozone? Um, well, first of all, can I say thank you very, much, very, very much for inviting me here to speak. I've spoken on these issues in various parts of the world, but there's nowhere uh, I would rather be, particularly as I know the weather is always like this in Dublin. So uh, it's, it's really, really a great pleasure and honour uh, to be here with, uh, with friends uh, to talk about these issues. Um, so this presentation has the very dramatic title of Can QE Save the Eurozone? Um, it's, it's slightly melodramatic, although I think there is a, a, an element of truth in it, which I, which I want to outline. But perhaps um, before I start, I should say uh, I'm, I'm reasonably optimistic about the prospects for the Eurozone um, in the sense that we've now had a pretty material decline in the oil price. We've had a significant fall in the value of the euro. And in many of the most troubled economies uh, in the Eurozone, there's been a very big decline in their government bond yields and interest rates and credit spreads in the last 18 months. Now, those three factors are all a significant stimulus to the economy. Um, and beliefs and expectations in economies like, particularly in continental Europe and Italy and France, are extremely pessimistic. And the good thing about that is if people are extremely pessimistic, it doesn't take very much actually to positively surprise them. So I would say that uh, we have half a chance that things will start to improve. However, I think there's been a, there's a sort of odd trap in the policy discussion in the Eurozone, which is it's a great danger to say that if you get an economic recovery, your policies have been successful. And I'll just give a very simple analogy. Uh, it seems to me policymaking in the Eurozone is a bit like somebody visiting their uh, local GP with all of the symptoms of the flu. And the man goes into the GP surgery, and the GP clobbers him over the head a few times, keeps on hitting him on the head, and he's slightly bewildered. And the GP takes out his pen, writes him a prescription um, for some antibiotics and sends him on his way. Uh, slightly baffled, takes his antibiotics, cured of his symptoms of the flu, returns several weeks later to the GP, obviously feeling a little bit circumspect, not too sure what the GP is going to do. And the GP says, you know, I assume all the flu symptoms have gone. Isn't it amazing what you can achieve with a good beating? Right? Now, the beating there for me is, is austerity. Um, and the antibiotics are monetary policy, right? Now, what I'd like to see is better antibiotics and a little bit less, less of the kind of random beatings. Um, and that's really what I'm going to talk about. So we have to be... Ex so really what I'm saying is, is not that there won't be a recovery in the Eurozone with the status quo. There probably will be. But that the status quo should definitely not be acceptable. Um, and all, there are, could be done an awful lot better than this. Um, and that's really the key point, uh, particularly um, as, you know, many examples like Ireland are being used as examples of success, which I think is, is misplaced for exact, exactly the analogy and the reasons of the analogy that I've given. Okay, so first of all, I'd just like to stand back a little bit and make some observations about economic policy, which I think have been revealed through the crisis. Um, the, the two here are, are interesting. The first one is... and. This is really an indictment of economic policymaking, is if you look globally, there has been no consensus over what to do with fiscal policy. Now, there's a very legitimate question to, to pose to all economists, which is how have you had centuries to think about this problem and you still can't agree what the right thing to do in a recession with fiscal policy is? Right? So if you think that one of, the, one of the key functions of economic policy is to, is to prevent recessions or generate a recovery from recessions, so all of the major regions and geographies of the world have pursued completely different fiscal policies. And I'll come back to that. But that's a, a, a very curious state of affairs. The second one is that if you look at central banks, what's quite extraordinary is actually the policies of central banking and the tools of central banking haven't actually changed since the very first central banks started operating. So if you look at the Swedish Riksbank, which I think they're better experts here than me on central banking, but I think it's one of the first, if not the first, recognized central bank. The very first central banks in the late 1700s, what did they do? They did two things. They started and helped to finance the government. Um, so they started government bond markets. That's actually QE. Right? So quantitative easing is exactly what central banks did at their very inception, which is buying government bonds. Um, and then the second thing they did was provide liquidity to the banking system. 
And that's right at the origins. Now, the interesting thing is, is that despite all the fancy names and the complicated ways in which they do it, essentially they're doing exactly the same two things today. Now, that's quite extraordinary. Central banks went from being relatively small, not very significant institutions to being the principal institutions of economic policymaking. And they actually haven't got any new tools. Nobody has really looked at it and said, if you had a blank sheet of paper, how would you organize a central bank today? So that's, those are two, for me, very, very striking observations. Why can't we agree what to do with fiscal policy after all this time? And why has there been no innovation in the tools of central banking? And I would like to propose, really, one innovation in the tools of central banking, which I think would be a lot more effective. I should also say at the outset that uh, a lot of this presentation will now get involved in very obtuse and abstract discussions of the distinction between fiscal and monetary policy. That's because I have to cover the fact that my policy prescription is blindingly obvious. Right? So when you look at it, it's kind of... And in fact, no economist ever says it won't work. In, so when you explain it to people, everybody pretty much accepts, you know, actually that would almost certainly work. But for some reason, economists and economic policymakers, particularly when we're confronted by very grave issues, we don't like the idea of very simple policies that would work with almost 100% certainty. Now, that in of itself is a very interesting psychological question. I suspect it actually is a psychological problem <laughs> rather than being an economic one. Anyway, hopefully I'll convince you of that and we can discuss that uh, during the Q&A. So the first thing we have to get out of the way is what is wrong with the Eurozone? Because t to anybody observing it, or if you're not a specialist or you don't follow all of the policy dates, it's profoundly confusing. Um, you have all of these different explanations from the fact that the, you know, the Greeks don't work hard, the Italian legal system takes too, too long to get things through court, all of these complicated labor market reform pensions. What is the, the root cause? Well, there are really two issues that economic policy tries to tackle. Uh, the first one is the economic cycle. So economic policy tries to prevent recessions, and when a recession occurs, it tries to generate recovery. And the second thing that policy focuses on is the long-term rate of GDP growth. Now, that's what all the structural reform is about. It's about long-term rate of GDP growth. So when you look at the demography, which determines labor supply, determines uh, the, the, the burden of, of people in retirement... Um, that's really about long-term growth rates. That doesn't cause demography, doesn't cause financial panics and major recessions. It determines growth in the very long term. That's also true of labor markets. That's also true of welfare systems. Now, the problem cyclically, you know, so none of that explains labor market structural reform. None of that explains why the eurozone is in a recession, stroke, depression. Right? That is about pessimism and optimism. It really is as simple as that. Now, pessimism is effectively what Mario Draghi made a, an important speech recently at Jackson Hole in the United States. He said there isn't enough spending. There isn't enough aggregate demand in the Eurozone. Now, that, all that means is households and businesses aren't spending enough. Now, why aren't they spending enough is because they're pessimistic. They're pessimistic. It's rational pessimism because their pessimism is self-fulfilling. All right, so if I'm a worker, I'm worried that I'm going to lose my job or I'm worried that my wages are going to be cut. So I don't spend very much. If I'm a firm, I think demand for my goods and services is going to be weak. I think my profits are going to be weak, so I don't invest. If I don't invest and I don't employ, the labor market is right to think that their wages are going to be cut and there's job insecurity. It's, it's very simple. Um, so what really needs to be tackled... Now, the structural issue is, is complicated and ultimately, in my view, should be the, the remit of member states should decide what their long-run rates of growth are by setting their policies. But macroeconomic policy really needs to tackle this issue of pessimism and insufficient spending. Now, if you're studying for the Leaving Certificate, the answer to this problem is actually very straightforward. Right, I, when I did economics at Leaving Cert many, many years ago, it would have been a very simple solution, which is you cut taxes, you increase government spending and you cut interest rates. So the first question we have to ask ourselves is why isn't that happening? <laughs> right, why hasn't that been the policy prescription? That is, in effect, what America did. America, late, very, very late in the economic recovery, they started to cut back on government spending, but essentially the, both Bush in 2008 and then the first thing that Obama did was cut taxes, increase government spending, and the Fed had been slashing interest rates. Right? And it worked. Right? The US economy has recovered. They're now getting, within 18 months, if things continue, America will be at full employment. So textbook economic policy has worked in the United States. So the interesting question then is, why hasn't the Eurozone followed what the United States did? Well, there's really, I think, two reasons. Um, the first one is the fiscal policy is, is, is almost illegal. And there's, there's sort of good reason for that, which is you don't have a federal government. 
So there's a major problem is how would you actually organize fiscal policy in the Eurozone if it isn't federalized? Because otherwise, you know, any individual country can start setting policies independently. So the only way they could, get, they could really get agreement, and particularly they very badly, in my view, made the fiscal compact in the midst of a crisis, um, has effectively neutered fiscal policy. There simply isn't enough flexibility to generate the kind of levels of demand that are necessary. So you, I met the, a senior official in the, the um, Italian finance ministry. The, the discussions the Italians are having with the European Commission are over 0.10 of a percentage point of their budget deficit. That doesn't even show up on an econometric model. Right? That is just simply statistical noise. If you want to have a fiscal impact, you need to do percentage points of GDP. So fiscal policy is severely hampered. Now, is monetary policy similarly hampered? Now, the problems with monetary policy have really arisen because, and this is why I want to talk about what would otherwise be an issue of semantics, this distinction between fiscal and monetary policy. So when European institutions were being put in place, it the, the, in order to effectively give up sovereignty over the, over the monetary authorities, it was very important that the delineation between fiscal and monetary policy was made clear. That is necessary effectively for the central bank to operate independently. If somehow fiscal policy could hijack monetary policy, the ECB wouldn't be able to oper, operate with independence. So the, the, the inability to coordinate fiscal policy means it's extremely important that that legal distinction between fiscal and monetary policy is maintained. Now, part of the problem in the Eurozone, and this is what I want to come on to in a minute, is to illustrate that in a financial crisis, the distinction between fiscal and monetary policy effectively collapses, and actually monetary policy becomes primary. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. So the questions then that arise are, have we got a course fundamental weakness in the structure of the Eurozone, because if in a financial crisis the distinction between monetary and fiscal policy collapse, how do we run a system where the two have to be separate legally? So is there a legal conflict with, with a fundamental need for counter-cyclical uh, demand management, so how to solve the, uh, the recession? And I will end, hopefully, by illustrating... Um, that I do actually think this, this circle can be squared. In other words, there is a Eurozone-specific policy that can solve this problem for us. Okay, so the distinction between fiscal and monetary policy. Now, most of us, if, if the two terms mean much at all, fiscal policy is understood as, as quite simply referring to taxation, government expenditure, and transfer payments by government. Monetary policy typically just is official interest rates, so the central bank changes interest rates. It can either raise the interest rate or cut interest rates. In that world, everything seemed pretty clear. There appears, superficially at least, to be a clear distinction between the two. Now, interestingly, if there are any economists or theoretical economists here, this actual distinction doesn't hold very well in economic theory. So if you read economic theory, actually, economists are very vague about this. Uh, Mervyn King was asked about the sort of policies I'm going to refer to, um, and he replied by saying, no, 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 that's fiscal policy. And when actually, if you quiz him on the precise distinction, it starts to become very, very vague as to what the distinction is. In fact, a lot of theoretical models effectively make the two the same. That's, for it, that's really just, though, for the economists to bear in mind. I think we can make a relatively clear distinction. And the first one, monetary policy, I think you can clearly say, has got to do with the issuance of currency. Right? So at least the role of monetary policy can be clearly defined there. Um, and the second thing I think that we start to realize when you look into it is that actually the distinction is not really an abstract theoretical one. It's an institutional one. So monetary policy is, in fact, what we say the central bank should do. And fiscal policy is actually what we say the government should do. Okay. So this, but this is important, though, because for a solution to be legal and viable in the Eurozone, it has to be true to that distinction. So it has to be clearly within the remit of the European Central Bank operating independently of governments. That's absolutely key. And it has to involve the issuance of currency. In my view, that becomes indisputably monetary policy. If it's being done by the ECB independently of the behavior of governments and involves the issuance of currency, that to me is both to, to the legal letter and also to the spirit of the definition. OK, now, before I come to the specific proposal, I just want to illustrate this point about what happens in a financial crisis, so why the distinction between fiscal and monetary policy collapses. So, Previously, we had this, this clear, apparently clear distinction. Tax expenditure is, is fiscal. 
creation of money and interest rates is, is the central bank. There's a profound observation about political organization in the work of, of David Hume writing in the, in the 1700s. And again, political organization is probably the one area which has been even slower to move in terms of genuine innovation than, than economics, which is not, not necessarily a bad thing. Now, Hume argues that there are three spontaneous institutions of social organization. So any society that you look at will have these three institutions. And what I really want to suggest to you is that in a financial crisis, you realize that sovereignty, sovereignty actually depends on our ability to issue currency. Right? So it's something that we ignore most of the time, and it only very rarely becomes relevant to a society. But actually, the ability to issue currency is extremely important. Money today is the financial system. Now, beneath the financial system, there are effectively, in most societies, developed countries, two contractual obligations. One is that the state will support deposits to varying magnitude, but we have to have deposit guarantees. Otherwise, we will have systematic collapse and threaten social stability. Now, this is, not, this is only made explicit in, in, in recent developments, but it's actually always there. And if Milton Friedman talks about this as one of the most important changes in the U.S. economy after the Great Depression was the introduction of deposit insurance. It's, it really ended the kind of very frequent banking panics that used to occur in the 1800s. The second implicit guarantee that is absolute is that the government won't default on its debt. Now, effectively, what happened in the... Now, the interesting question is, can a sovereign state do that if it doesn't control money? I don't think you can. Because the only reason deposit insurance is credible is if I can issue currency. If I can issue currency, I can say your deposits are absolutely guaranteed. If I can issue currency, I can say your government debt is absolutely guaranteed. Now, the financial system depends on those two things. If you take away or threaten those two obligations, the financial system breaks down and society breaks down. <laughs> Certainly the financial system as it's been constructed. Now the problem in the Eurozone crisis was exactly those two fundamental obligations came into question. Right? And that is really what's thrown apart the institutional structure. In other words, people did not know if their deposits were safe and they did not know if government, if, if government obligations would be honoured. Now I should say, in economic theory, actually, there is an assumption that the state is, has primacy over the central bank. So if anybody looks in an economic textbook, it's assumed that ultimately the central bank is consolidated into the government. So if you look at, for example, the profits that the Bank of England gets made, gets remitted to, to the UK Treasury, the Fed, and during the financial crisis, you know, finance minister and central bank governor would stand side by side, and that is how things operate. What is genuinely unique about the Eurozone is that the central bank has legal primacy over member states. Now, that is, in many ways, is quite extraordinary. So the truth is, it isn't Angela Merkel is definitively not the most important decision maker in the Eurozone. The single most important decision maker is the president of the European Central Bank. <laughs> Absolutely, because that is actually the only European institution. And not only that, there's a fascinating aspect of of the ECB's regulations, which is the ECB can compel member states to increase its capital. <laughs> so the ECB can actually say to them, after the executive council of the ECB has a vote, um, they can just command an increase in their capital. Um, and this is, this is precisely why I, I've, in London, had meetings with new policymakers coming into various European governments. When, when Hollande came to power, his economy minister came over to London, similarly in Italy, and they outline all their policies, and I always say to them, you know, have you met with, with Mario Draghi yet? Because that's the most important meeting. Um, because actually, he will, he ultimately determines what's going to happen here. Um, there is a, you, you, your margin of movement, and there, this of course does throw up huge issues of democratic legitimacy. I think it's also, for me, very revealing from a purely political perspective. I mean, how many members of the governing council, for example, do we know? Does anybody know who the head of the Portuguese central bank is? Um, these are very interesting questions because I actually think not nearly enough attention is being paid to who those people are. Um, you know, the, the, the uh, president of the Irish central bank is an extremely important individual. Right? Anybody who influences the decision-making of this body in key moments in time uh, is, of, is of critical political importance. Right, so what's the solution? What I'd just like to do very quickly is describe why I think monetary policy 
has become central to economic policymaking, dominant relative to fiscal policy. And I just wanted to very simply outline what the pros and cons of monetary and fiscal policy are, which then I think is a neat way of framing uh, the policy recommendation that myself and others are, are suggesting in the Eurozone, but also actually as a policy that could be uh, broadened and applied to other countries as well. Now, you can see there immediately that there is much more in favor of monetary policy than there is against it, and relative to fiscal policy as well. And I'll just go some, through some of the key points. So the one good thing about fiscal policy is that it can affect spending directly. So were the Irish government to announce overnight that there's going to be a cut in income taxes uh, with immediate effect, that would be a boost to spending in the economy pretty much immediately. Even if they announced it, if, if, if the Eurozone announced a huge fiscal stimulus, you would immediately get an increase in economic activity because firms would immediately anticipate that there's going to be an increase in their sales and improvement in their profits. People would already anticipate an increase in demand. So the one good thing about fiscal policy is that it affects spending directly. Um, the second thing is it can be used to support other objectives, like infrastructure, like inequality. The problem is, and these, this is a, self, is, is, a, is a fatal flaw in fiscal policy, goes back to the point that people can't agree on it. Right? So it would be great, but we can't agree on it. So every country pursues different routes, different parts of the political spectrum argue about it, vested interests get involved, and, the, and as a result, it tends not to be timely. So what happens is infrastructure, infrastructure is a great idea if infrastructure is a good thing to do, but it's not a good way to manage a recession because infrastructure takes lots of planning if it's to be done well, it takes lots of time to execute, and it can become hostage to vested interests. So I'm, I'm very much in favor of infrastructure spending. I just don't think it's the right way to stop recessions or indeed to generate recoveries. It's, it's simply not timely. Um, fiscal policy is very difficult to coordinate, it, and as I, may, as I referred to, there are, there are vested interests. Now, what about monetary policy? Well, almost everything is the opposite. So the wonderful thing about monetary policy is you can just have a meeting, you can even have a conference call, and you can do it instantaneously. So decision-making is extremely quick. There is huge consensus, actually, about what to do. So pretty much everywhere in the world has broadly done similar things. I mean, they can argue over QE or LTROs, but effectively they've all been doing the same thing. So there's consensus. It's independent of politics, and so it isn't perceived to be influenced by vested interests. In that sense, it's, it's not ideological. Now, the fatal flaw, in a sense, or the current problem that's being revealed, though, with monetary policy is this key point its effects are indirect. If the ECB announces a QE program tomorrow, it actually doesn't affect any of our disposable incomes. And in fact, when you think about it, it works in a very, very convoluted and indirect way, right? which is it requires people to change their balance sheets, so it's trying to encourage people to borrow. It's negative for savers, and it tries to move asset prices, so they try to get the stock market up, house my housing market up, they try and get the currency down, so indirectly affect people's behavior. And in fact, we've started to realize that there are major limits to this. In the world when interest rates were at 10% and you could slash interest rates, then it had a, a very pronounced and, and immediate effect. But when interest rates are pretty close to zero, when people don't want to borrow, when people actually want to save, and asset prices only affect a small segment of the population, particularly if, if housing itself is being influenced by other factors. So the solution here, it seems to me, is quite clear which is we want to keep what's good about monetary policy. So we want it to be you able to make decisions extremely quickly. You want it to be credible and independent, so subject to an inflation target. Everybody, broadly, there is a huge consensus that we want to have a stable rate of inflation. Everybody can agree on that across ideological bands. Um, we want it to operate independently of a political cycle. Um, but we need to solve this problem. It, ha it can't be indirect. We want it to be direct. We want it to affect spending immediately in the way that interest rates used to. If, if people are familiar with the UK, where people borrowed variable rate mortgages, it was effectively, as soon as the Bank of England cut interest rates, households' cash flow got improved instantaneously. We need to find a way where monetary policy in increases people's spending immediately. So that comes to um, what John Mulbauer, uh, professor of economics at Oxford, has described as QE for the people. Um, and this is the deceptively simple um, solution, um, which, for, in my view, is largely poses a presentational problem. Um, it's a bit like, you know, if, if a kind of eight-year-old 
by for some reason kind of wanders into some very serious discussion about economics and here's Mario Draghi and Ben Bernanke having this discussion and they're all saying there isn't enough aggregate demand and sort of, what does that mean? It means they're not spending enough and, and the eight-year-old just says, why don't you just give them more money? Um, well, in fact, I, I, I would like to hear their answer. They probably tell them, you know, sorry, you don't understand. It's much more complicated than that. Um, that is, in effect, what Mark Blythe and I and a number of others uh, are recommending, which is that you have a simple solution, which is that you allow that the ECB itself um, prints money and makes transfers directly to the household sector. Uh, John Mulbauer at Oxford has suggested that you could entirely avoid using governments if you use the electoral reg register, which is public information, and they just post a check. So post a check of a thousand euros to everyone on the electoral register in the eurozone. Um, now, what will happen? Would it work? The, the really intriguing thing is, I, I haven't met an economist who doesn't think it would work. Right? So it is. It's pretty. It doesn't matter what type of an economist you are. I mean, some of them desperately try to say there'd kind of be an instantaneous increase in inflation without any increase in activity. But even them, you know, even very convoluted models show that under very easy assumptions, it'll affect spending. All of the empirical evidence suggests it will increase spending. So George W. Bush, you know, God bless him, did something very similar, probably not realizing this is what he was doing. Um, and and it, in, he did it in 2008, but they called it tax rebates. Now, that's, that's just a name. Um, to, you, you could call it a tax rebate if you want to call it a tax rebate, but that's just framing. That's just a description. They gave people a check, and the Fed was doing QE at the same time. That's implicitly, that's the same thing. All of the evidence said it increased spending. Uh, had they done a lot more, and had they done it continuously, it would have increased spending even more. So the Americans have used tax rebates um, many times in the past, and they've been successful. Now, what most people worry about immediately is that it would cause inflation. And this is worth thinking about a little bit. Um, firstly, we're recommending it should be done subject to the inflation target. So we're doing it to help the ECB actually get somewhere close to their target. So the first key point is that the ECB is miles away from 2%, which was their own definition of price stability. Uh, but I personally don't think you want to try and create inflation. Inflation actually isn't the problem. The problem is demand. So I don't, I don't really mind if inflation goes up or down. I just want spending to occur, an economic recovery to be sustained, investment spending and employment to be created. And what happens to prices is highly unknown. There's not going to be runaway inflation. There's, there's no circumstance in which that's plausible. You know, we're talking about maybe two, three percentage points of GDP um, in much smaller scale than quantitative easing. Right? Quantitative easing, if you look at the United States, the UK and Japan, has been 30 to 40 percent of GDP. So if you're worried about inflationary effects from money printing, worry about QE. Here are you two, three percentage points on any simple economic, economic model. Two or three percentage points of GDP are going to have a dramatic impact on the economy. And you would persist in doing that. Now, is it legal? I hope I've convinced you that it's legal, because it seems to me that the distinction between fiscal and monetary policy um, is about whether it's got to do with money create, printing money or not. That is the clear delineation. And this would involve printing money by the central bank. In the context of Europe, the distinction between fiscal and monetary policy is defined institutionally. Right? So it's very, very clear that the ECB is not allowed to finance the activities of governments. Well, that's not financing the activity of governments. Right? So this does not depend on the tax policy of Italy or Italy's budget or the, um, or the, the, the French uh, whether France meets its fiscal targets or not, or what Germany does with its fiscal targets. This would be done independently by the ECB, direct to the population of Europe. Um, I think in many ways, actually, it is fairer than interest rate cuts, in fact. So again, people say, but, you know, this, but wouldn't you be favoring, how do you decide how much to do? The obvious, amount, the obvious approach is to do it equally uh, to all citizens. That's, that's clear. You just, just do it equally. Now, when people talk about issues of fairness, that to me is a lot fairer than changing interest rates. I mean, when you change interest rates, there's a very clear winners and losers, right? So you are punishing, if you want to use you know, moralistic terminology, people who save and favoring those who've been borrowing. Um, if you do QE and you try to drive up asset prices, you're favoring the holders of assets. Um, so these all have distributional consequences. This is why when you actually start to think about what's fiscal and monetary policy, you really do discover the, that the distinction is, is by institutional definition. It's very difficult to make the distinction in the abstract. So uh, it is, 
I think it is, it is rigorously legal. Now, the interesting question then is, is, is why not, and why hasn't it been done elsewhere? Um, well, as I said, alluded to, policies very similar to this have been done uh, elsewhere. Um, could it happen in the Eurozone? How probable is that? Um, the honest answer is I don't know. Um, but I'm encouraged because a lot of serious people are supporting the view. So to give some examples, you now have two former members of the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England who are advocates. So Willem Boiter, who's a Dutch, very renowned Dutch economist and was a member of the Monetary Policy Committee in, in, in the UK, has written papers effectively arguing in a very theoretical way. I'd only recommend them if you, uh, if you like reading through lots of equations, but he's He's, uh, he has written articles advocating these policies. Sushil Wadwani, another member uh, of the Monetary Policy Committee, uh, believes that the Bank of England should effectively have the ability to do this. And then Lord Turner, who was the chairman of the FSA, uh, has advocated something very, very close and similar to this. A number of economists at Bocconi University in Milan are advocating something similar. Um, so it is, it is gathering traction. Um, I suspect the main resistance uh, is what I alluded to right at the outset, um, which is a psychological one. The first thing is, is that if the ECB were to do it, there's clearly be some administrative challenges. You know, so actually getting the checks out um, would pose some challenges. So I think innovative ideas in that regard are all welcome. Um, I don't know how whether an electoral register is, is, is robust enough a means. Um, but the, the, how one would actually administer the issue, I think, is, is a very material challenge. Um, but I think the more profound one is, populations are going to turn around and say, why on earth didn't you do this sooner? Right? We're gonna, there's going to be a lot of very, very embarrassed economists and policymakers who are going to be sort of sitting red-faced as they've come up with loads of acronyms that nobody understands, hugely convoluted programs using hundreds of billions, trillions of euros on their balance sheet when all it required was actually 2 or 3% of GDP uh, and a transfer to most of the household sector and actually a recession could have ended quite quickly and a lot of human misery pre prevented. Um, and actually, that would be quite embarrassing. Um, anyway, on that uh, cheery note, <laughs> I'll leave it there.